Let's stand to our feet. I am looking again at Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, notice, sin lieth at the door. That word lieth, I told you last week, means to crouch. Like a lion crouches waiting for his prey to come by. When the door opens, the lion is there to pounce. And unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. Praise God. Last week we talked about the danger of opening doors that God has closed. And uh, we dealt with that, I feel like, fairly adequately. Today I want to talk about the danger in opening doors that we have closed. Turn to your neighbor say, don't open that door. Why don't you turn to someone else and say, please close that door. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Obviously, there are days and there are seasons in life where God graciously shuts doors for us. You know, when we didn't have the foresight or the courage to shut the door to temptation or trouble ourselves, God took it upon himself to do what we could not or would not do, and that was to shut the door. Thank God for that. What I want to deal with today is the fact that there are times and seasons where God expects us to shut our own door. We want to talk about that. I believe the Lord's going to help us. Uh, My first example here uh, is the life of Rahab. If you remember the children of Israel after spending 40 years in the wilderness were being led by Joshua who took over from Moses to cross the river Jordan, enter into Canaan. They surrounded Jericho and the walls of Jericho were going to come down and the city was going to be eliminated. Joshua had sent two spies into the city and it was in that encounter with Rahab that a covenant was established between the two spies, Joshua and Rahab. Rahab being a Gentile prostitute understood that Jericho's days were numbered, that destruction was coming that the God of these Jewish people was far superior to all of their idols that they worshipped. And she entered into a pact or a covenant with these two spies that her house and herself would be spared. And so they made this agreement. As long as Rahab and her family stays inside the house, behind closed doors, they would be safe. In fact, they were to find out that the only safe place in Jericho for anybody to be was in the house of Rahab and behind those closed doors because everybody else in the city was slaughtered. How do I know that? Joshua chapter 2 verse 19. The spies make this covenant with Rahab. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out the doors of thy house and out into the street, his blood shall be upon his head. And we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head if any harm come to him or any hand be upon him. So what we've got here is we've got the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon the city of Jericho. The walls are going to miraculously, they're going to fall flat 
and then the army of Israel is going to go in and clean house. What you need to see here is when you go over these stories, we find Doors mentioned prominently concerning Noah and the pre-flood world, concerning doors and Sodom and and how that uh, Lot was in the house and the angels shut the door and and kept the inhabitants of, of Sodom out. The, the doors mentioned in Egypt where they were to put on the Passover, blood of the lamb, the doorposts and lentil. And then, of course, the doors mentioned here in Jericho with Rahab's home. These were doors marked with safety, which God established. In other words, all of these were divine instances of God pouring out his wrath through these instances and situations, and yet in the midst of judgment, in the midst of destruction, we find that there was a way out. There was a door of safety. You need to hear it. Along with God's judgment always comes uh, tempered by His justice. Uh, All of us today in this room should be asking the question. Cliff said it. We're at the brink of the coming of the Lord. Judgment is coming. A new age is on the way. We all should be asking in today's world where is the the door of safety for me when the judgments of God arrive against the wicked. I've got an answer for you because when you go into the New Testament, it's Jesus who said, I am the door. If any man enters in by me, he shall be saved. Jesus is the door. I'll say it again. Jesus is the door. Sometimes it's not divine judgment that we are closing the door to like Rahab closed her door to the judgment of Jericho. Sometimes it's not divine judgment. Sometimes we are closing the door to the voices of skeptics. And seduction. And we want to talk about both of them this morning. Like for instance, there was a widow in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 4. The Bible says very clearly that she shut her door to the skepticism and the scrutiny of her neighbors. Uh, Let me read it to you. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 3. What do we have? We have Elisha who comes on to the scene. This poor widow has two sons. She's heavily in debt. They have threatened to take her two sons into servitude unless she can pay off her debt. She makes her appeal to Elisha. Elisha asks, well, what do you have in your house? And she said, all I've got is a pot of oil. Or in the Hebrew Old Testament, a flask. It wasn't even a pot. It was a flask of oil, she said. And so he instructs her sons to do what? To go all around the neighborhood and gather up as many empty pots as possible and bring them into the house. Let me read it to you. Then he said, go borrow the vessels abroad from all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, watch it, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all of those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is Full. She shut the door with these pots in the house doing what? Shutting herself off. This is me speaking from her noisy, nosy neighbors. Now there's a lesson there for us if we'll take it. When you go into the Hebrew, you find that it's inferred in the text that once the widow started pouring the oil out of her flask, 
It wasn't going to stop. She wasn't going to fill this pot up and then stop and then walk over here and fill this pot up. In other words, once the oil started flowing, there was going to be no end to its flow until she signaled an end to it. The oil would not stop flowing until all the pots were filled and when she felt she was done. And so what she did is she had her sons uh, get close and gather up all the pots, get them all in line. And she just went down the line and she just kept pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. And you say, what are you saying, Pastor Hires? What I'm saying is this. This woman could not afford to take the time to go answer the door knock from some nosy neighbor who wanted to know, why did you uh, borrow all those pots? She couldn't stop the flow of the oil. If she ever stopped, that was the end of the miracle. She couldn't risk stopping the flow by answering the door or responding to her neighbor. And so she probably told those boys, whatever you do, boys, uh, don't stop lining up those pots uh, for me to fill. Let's keep pouring out the oil until we have filled every final pot in the house. Uh, I want to say something to somebody here this morning. Today is not a day to quit. Uh, If God is pouring out into your life something good now's not the time to stop there's still oil to be poured out in your life and in your family there's still time left there's still work for you to do In other words, I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. Until you stop breathing, God's got something good flowing through you. And if you'll stick with the job, God will continue to pour out His Spirit through you to touch the lives of others. Don't stop. Creditors were coming to take her. Boys, if she didn't cough up that cash, She wasn't about to let anyone or anything interfere with her faith or her focus or her future. In other words, I got my mind made up. I've got my focus on my miracle. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to shut up until the miracle is complete. Can't let anybody get in your way. Can't let anybody distract you from your objective. Sometimes you have to shut the door on the voices of skeptics. Those who would divide your loyalties or distract your attention. I can just imagine someone asking us, what are you going to do with all those pots? Don't have time to answer, honey. I'm busy filling my pots. Go bother somebody else. Go talk to somebody else. I don't have time to answer the door. I don't have time to talk to you. Jesus is coming and I want to be ready. There's always going to be someone fluttering around saying, you know, God doesn't perform miracles like that anymore in today's world. There's always going to be people hanging around with a sour look on their face saying things like, that preacher just wants to make you look silly by borrowing all of those pots. There are always going to be people, the namesayers, the gainsayers, the negative, and I've got to shut the door to all of that and wake up to my miracle. Sometimes you have to tell people, if I have to choose between my relationship with Jesus 
and my relationship with you. It's been good knowing you. I can't let my peers, I can't let my friends, I can't even let my family stand between me and my miracle. For some of us this morning, we need to lay it all on the line. We need to decide in our minds, I'm doing a good work. I'm not going to stop until the miracle is done. Not everybody's going to understand your burden. Not everybody's going to understand your vision. Not everybody's going to understand your need. You just have to shut the door to the skeptics and the scoffers. Somehow you got to make up your mind. I don't know what everybody else is going to do, but I'm going to get in my house. I'm going to shut the door and I'm going to pour myself out unto the Lord until my miracle is done. One widow shut the doors to her house to the scrutiny of neighbors. When you go just a few verses later in that same chapter, 2 Kings chapter 4, there's another story about doors. What you find is that here we go with Elisha the prophet again. And we find this time, Elisha shuts his door to the desperate plea of a mama. Let me read it to you. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 32. Just a few verses later. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, Elisha did, and shut the door. Everybody said he shut the door. He shut the door door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. The story there over the years, Elisha the prophet had stayed at this Shunammite woman's home on several occasions, numerous occasions. After a while, she and her husband added a room to their house just for the exclusive use of the prophet to accommodate him. It's that room that she takes her dead boy to and lays him on Elisha's bed. And it's that room and that door that Elisha shut. So here's Elisha. He appreciates all of this generosity this Shunammite woman showing him. So he sent Gehazi to go ask her, what can be done for you? What can we do for you? Maybe we could speak to the king for you. Maybe we could speak to the captain of the army for you. Her response to that was, nope, my family takes good care of me. I'm doing good. Later, Elisha again, he's scratching his head wondering, how can we bless this woman? He asked Gehazi again, what might be done for her? Well, you read the text, you find out Gehazi knew that this woman had never had a child. He also knew that her husband was now an old man. He would die soon. She would be left alone and destitute with no one to help her. And so <clears throat> Elisha called her in that very day, called her in. She stood in the doorway. I'm sure there's significance to that. She stood in the doorway and Elisha asked her about the fact that she had never had any children. So Elisha told her, he said, this time next year, you're going to be holding a brand new baby in your arms. You know what her response to that was? She said, don't you be lying to me, preacher. Get my hopes up and all. That's what she told him. Yep, sure enough, one year later, she has this little baby boy. 
He's the love of her life. A few years later, however, this little boy out in the field suffered this terrific headache, and he died within his mama's own lap there in the field. She took her dead boy, carted him back to the house, climbed those stairs, put him on Elisha's bed, and then she had her donkey brought to her, and she climbed on her donkey, and she went to go find the man of God, Elisha. When it became clear to Elisha from a distance that her son was dead, he sent Gehazi ahead with Elisha's staff. I want you to touch the head of the dead boy with my staff so that he will live. Well, nothing happened. Gehazi couldn't raise the little boy from the dead. When Elisha arrived, the Bible says he didn't say anything. He entered into the room where the dead boy lay on the bed. And then the Bible says very clearly, Elisha, he shut the door. Now, you should know by now that there's never a phrase in the Bible that's there by accident. God's just not... uh, talking because he's running out of things to say. In other words, there's significance to the fact that Elisha shut the door. God in the 21st century wanted us here to know that there's significance to that. And the significance is, I think this, he did not want this mother's grief, anger, or accusations in his ears while he's trying to figure out what God is trying to do here. Think about it. Um, He, from a distance, sent Gehazi to go pray for the boy. The boy wasn't raised from the dead. The woman came all the way to him, jumped off her donkey, and she ran and grabbed his feet. And Elisha didn't know why she was there because God had not told. So at this stage, Elisha doesn't know what is going on here, what is God trying to do, what's been done in the past isn't working this time around, what, 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 what's happening now that's different, distinct from previous miracles. Uh, he's in a quandary here. And the last thing he needs is mama standing in the door with running commentary. Things like, I told you not to get my hopes up. Think about it. I was afraid something like this would happen if your prophecy came true. Why would God give me a miracle baby, Cliff, and then take it away? You can just imagine her heart, how she feels. I didn't ask for this boy, preacher. And if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be sitting here all broken hearted and in grief. You can just imagine. She'd have a boatload of things to be telling the man of God about. And so he shut the door to all of that. Elisha went in. And he shut the door. God, me and you got to talk. Everything I've tried so far hasn't worked. You gave this woman the boy miraculously and I can't believe you'd take him away. So God, you're going to have to tell me what needs to happen. So the Bible says he prayed a while and then the Bible says he warmed up the corpse a while. He'd lay, stretch himself out on the corpse, warming up the flesh of the child. He'd get up a while and he'd pray And then when he didn't hear anything from the Lord, he would stretch himself out on the corpse again, trying to warm up the corpse. After a long while, the Bible doesn't tell us how long, suddenly the boy's eyelids flittered and he sneezed seven times and he opened his eyes. And Elisha took him back to his mama. I'm telling you, There are times we have to shut the door 
on the skeptics and the scoffers and the questions. There are people here in this building, listen to me. I know that you're grieving like this woman. I know you're grieving. I know you're hurt. Maybe you lost a marriage. Maybe you lost a family member. Maybe you lost a good friend. I can only guess how you might feel having uh, someone kick you in the gut. Because that's the way it would be feeling right now for people in this room. You've lost something. We need to hear it. God works with us different ways. God's always pulling something new on us. What he does one way the first time he may do completely different the next. I think you know by now there's a time to run and hide when it comes to battling sexual addiction or temptation. There's a time to run and hide. But there's also a time to stand and fight when you are battling for your faith and you've got your armor on and the shield of faith up there are other times that you're going to hold your peace and let the Lord fight the battle I'm here to tell somebody this morning you need to hold your peace and let the Lord come to your aid you just need to hold your peace and let the Lord fight your battle for you you just need to hold your peace and shut the door to the namesayers In other words, this morning, if you've got a pulse, God's got a plan. Go read Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. God's got a good plan. For every one of us. Somebody needs to hear it. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Until God says it's over. Elisha shut the door. To the desperate plea. Of a mama. A widow shut her door. To nosy neighbors and the skeptics. I believe the believer, I'm talking about us today. Turn to your neighbor saying he's talking about me. The believer, we have to learn how to shut the door on the skeptic. There are a lot of well-meaning people in the world. They don't have a clue as to what to tell you when you're in a crisis. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many people have been told by well-meaning people something in their grief, your grief, that you took offense to because they don't have a clue as to how you're really feeling. They mean well, but they don't have a clue. It happens more than you think. Matthew chapter 6 verse 6 says this. But when thou prayest, what do we do? Enter into your closet and when thou hast Again, when thou hast shut the door, why would you need to shut the door? Pray to thy Father which is in secret. What I'm telling God is a secret. It's just between me and God. I don't need prying ears. I don't need skeptics and scoffers. I don't need people questioning my motives or questioning my prayer. Your Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You know, there are a lot of people out there. They feel like, well, why even pray? Pray never helped me any. Doesn't do you any good anyway. There are a lot of people that feel that way. They don't pray. For the people in this building sitting here in these chairs, don't let people talk you out of your miracle. They'll always be friends. They'll always be bystanders. They'll always be neighbors who are saying things like, you're barking up the wrong tree if you're expecting God to answer that one. See, the last thing you need is well-meaning negativity. From otherwise good people. What you need is you need to be alone with God. You don't need to hear from them. You need to hear from God. You don't need to hear from your neighbor. You need to hear from God. You don't need to hear from your friend. You need to hear from God. 
What are you going to do with a house full of borrowed pots anyway? You know what your answer to that should be? You shut the door. That's what you need to do, right? What makes you think a prophet can do anything to help your dead son? You know what you need to do? You just need to shut the door on that voice. Oh, I wish somebody would get with me this morning. Somebody says, but you know you're just making a fool out of yourself. What you need to do is you just need to shut the door. Oh, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're saying. I would say, shut the door. Oh, come on. It doesn't make sense to pay tithes to a church when you can't pay your bills. You know what I say to that? As a proof, knowing that God blesses the tither, you just need to shut the door. There's always going to be somebody on the sidelines. I don't know why you go to that church anyway. They're just trying to brainwash you. Shut that door. There's always somebody that's going to say, you're not going to end up with the miracle you're looking for. You're just going to end up in a big mess. Shut the door. Shut the door. Shut the door. Sometimes you got to shut the door and just get in your prayer closet and listen to God for a change about your miracle and His intentions toward you. I got to hurry here. Here's the elephant in the room. The believer shuts his door to the skeptic. The widow shuts the door, her door, to nosy neighbors. Elisha shut the door on a grieving mama. Sometimes God expects you to shut the door. On the devil. You're waiting on God to shut your door. And God is expecting on you to shut that door. Do you know Satan talks to us? A lot like God talks to us. God uses people, places, things, time to talk to us. Satan also uses people to get to us. Satan speaks. If you've ever heard his whisper, there's the voice of God, there's the voice of man, there's the voice of the enemy. Might we say Satan or demonic activity. Three voices in your life. How do you know which is which? Well, I will tell you this. If a voice in your head says, you need to go pray, it's not your flesh that said that. (laughs) I guarantee it. Satan will never tell you, you need to go pray. Well, process of elimination, that means it's probably God speaking to me. The devil talks to us. You shut the door on the devil, don't you believe that he talks through the door to you? And what he wants is he wants you to open the door and let him in. Just this one time. This is the way it works. This is why you go back to the beginning with Cain. God told him very plainly, Cain, at your shut door, on the other side of that door, there's a, a lion. There's the enemy. There's the serpent that's talking through the door, wanting to get you to, Open the door. You open that door, you're toast. Many people don't understand this business of opening and closing spiritual doors. 
Let me lay some of it out for you. Let's just say you've closed the door to an addiction. You closed that door weeks ago, months ago, for some even maybe years ago. We've worked with people in and out of rehabilitation facilities for a long time. Believe me, I've heard their stories, and I grieve with them when I hear those stories. I've seen guys personally, friends with, stay sober and clean for well over a year. And then on an inopportune moment, they opened that door, and they let back in all of that that them and God had kicked out months and years ago. Maybe for over a year, specifically, I remember the instance, you've stayed sober and clean. You've stopped at that stop sign and turned left to go to work for over 365 days, a year or more. On this particular day, You come to a stop at the stop sign. You turn left toward your job and responsibility. You turn right to a crack house that you used to visit fairly often. You've got a crisp $100 bill in your pocket. And you turn right instead of left, throwing away all common sense and sanity. And we talk to ourselves, and the devil talks to us. You convince yourself, hey, I've done really well all year long. I'm proud of myself. Surely I can handle this stuff now because me and God, see, are on the same side. I got God now. I didn't have God before. I can handle this stuff now, I had a guy tell me one time he went back <clears throat> to a crack habit because he convinced himself in his mind, I just wanted to see if God had really delivered me. God had, right? But then he opened the door and it come rushing back in. This is the danger of opening doors that you have closed. Had guys say, well, you know, pastor, after a year, I mean, I've been clean for over a year. I just wanted one night. I just want to let my hair down. I, I deserve a pat on the back. I deserve a good night on the town. I deserve a celebration. We celebrate they did. They opened the door. And what they thought no longer even existed comes back in their face full force, sometimes even worse. Now, for those of you that have never had any kind of an addiction like that, let me relate it to you. If you think it's a breeze for you to say no to an addiction, like what I'm talking about, you know what you need to do? You just need to think sugar. I'm not preaching against sugar. I'm trying to help you understand how demanding an addiction can be. You say, well, Pastor Hires, it's completely different because I can put off those sweets and I can turn down that chocolate and I can walk away from those pastries any day I get ready. Right. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Just trying to help you understand. Let's stand to our feet. Maybe you expelled demonic influences. You resisted multiple attacks by the enemy. Maybe you fought hell and high water to get back to sobriety. And you and God, you closed that door and you bolted it shut. And in that frame of mind, I'll never go back to that life again. 
I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Here's what we don't understand is that Satan is still at the door, but he's on the other side of the door. And he's telling you all kinds of things. Why don't you just let me in? He's tried every trick in the book to get you to open that door. Remember, he's had 6,000 years of practice on human beings. Through the door, Satan has promised you love, money, friends, popularity. Oh, come on now. Why don't you just open this door just this one time? Let's have a good time for a change. You deserve a day off. But here's what we don't get. And I say this with all sincerity. You ever kick demonic influence out of your life? You close and lock that door? You need to understand the Bible's very specific as to what happens with those evil spirits. The Bible says in Luke chapter 11, verse 24, the Bible says, when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But there's no people in the desert. There's nobody to torment in the desert. There are no other human beings to possess in the desert. They're walking through dry places seeking rest. They want someone to inhabit. But when they find none, they say, oh, I will return to the person I came from. And so they come back to your door that has been bolted and locked. He comes back and he finds that the former house Oh, it's all swept and in order and ready for me. You know what that word means, swept and in order? It's got the connotation of empty. We've cleaned the house out. We've swept the floors. Everything's clean and bright and in order. And then what does that spirit do? That spirit then finds seven other spirits, even more evil than itself. And they all, when the person scratches his head, listens to the voice, gets convinced, well, you know, maybe one more time won't hurt, unbolts the door and opens it. They all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That is revelatory for some people in this building. We're going to pray in just a minute for people who are struggling in that area. You know, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough to just kick the devil out. And bolt the door behind him. It's not enough to remain neutral. It's not enough just to empty yourself out. But you need to fill it back up with something else. Every once in a while you'll find someone who has the human willpower to conquer a habit, a vice, an addiction. And they did it all by themselves. They did it by their willpower every once in a while. But human willpower is often not enough to rid ourselves of addictions and vices and habits that we just haven't been able to break. What do we need, Pastor? I'll tell you what we need. You empty out the container. You kick that devil out. Your house is now swept and empty. You know what you need? You need to fill it back up. Well, how do I do that, preacher? You do that by, Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. Let God fill you up from stem to stern. See this bottle here? It's full, right? What's it got in it? If I were to unscrew the lid and drink it down, would the bottle be empty? No. All that's happened is 
the air has rushed in while the water has rushed out. And I'll tell you how you need to kick the enemy out of your life and out of your house if you will be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of God will push the enemy out. And when the enemy leaves, he won't come back six months later to an empty house. He'll come back to a house that's full of joy and peace and righteousness and love. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here. Close your eyes all over the building. I'm not here to exploit anybody. I'm not here to embarrass anybody. I'm not here to make anybody feel ill at ease. But I will say this. There are people in this building that can relate to this business of shutting the door to Satan. And I'm telling you, if you'll come to this altar, if you'll repent of all of your sin, if you'll ask God to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God will fill you up and push up all that out and you'll walk out of here a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're here this morning and you've served God for a period of time but there are a few areas of your life in which you still struggle. Things that you haven't quite got all the victory over. What I want you to do, I want you to come to this altar and I want you to come and pray about this. Uh, understanding you got to close the door. You got to have a conversation with the God and you got to put the devil in his place. Uh, I'm here to tell you, God wants to fill us this morning. God wants to renew us this morning. I'd like for you to come. If you would, come. Let's Get out of our pews. Let's come down to the front here this morning. Come on. That's it all over the building. The best way to fill your container this morning, the best way to fill your house this morning is to fill it with something else. Fill it up with the Holy Ghost. Fill it up with the power of God. Fill it up with the joy of the Lord. That's it. Let's come. Let's come. Find a place to pray. Let's talk to the Lord about this.